A very special good morning to each one of you. It's just great to be with you again on the program. Friends, we, uh, we want to say something to you right at the outset. And this is from my trusty horse here, Snowy. He's come up today to say hello to you. We've been for a good ride. Snowy, you want to greet the uh, viewers here? He's uh, really become a good friend of mine. When I've come back from an overseas trip, we go for a nice ride together and we spend time together. I hope you've got a nice pet. Maybe you're into dogs, I don't know. Maybe you like cats, budgies, I don't know. Maybe you like horses. But these are all God's creation, you know, and I just love them so much. I want to say to you, maybe you are battling. And you're saying, Angus, I don't know, actually know what to do. I don't know who to go to. I've got so many trials and tribulations. I am really battling. Well, I've got good news for you. There is one who knows every one of your infirmities. He knows every one of the trials you're going through. And he says to you, don't worry. He says, speak to me, and I'm listening. Folks, if we go in the Word of God to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4 and verse 15, this is what the Word of God says. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. He is not ignorant, folks, about what you're going through. You say you are really struggling in areas in your life. Speak to Jesus about it. You know what I love about the Lord? Unlike other gods that are made of stone, and our figments of people's imagination. Our God's alive. He's for real. He walked on this earth for 33 years. He knows everything about you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. There's not a sparrow that falls from the sky that he doesn't know about. So speak to him. Take your cares to him. Cast your cares upon him, in fact. He says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Cast your cares upon me because I care for you. Folks, I want to ask you, are you walking that road of suffering? That road that's called the Via Dolorosa. That's the Latin word for the road that Jesus walked on with his cross on the day of his crucifixion. Directly translated, it means the road of suffering. It means the painful way. He understands about pain and suffering. You see, there are some people that have no concept about what you are talking about. That's why you'll of, of, often find, and I've got no problem with riches. I've got no problem with people that are doing well. I'm doing well. I've got uh, five children. They all love the Lord, and so do their spouses. I've got nine grandchildren. They love Jesus. Okay, I'm living on a farm. I'm living my dream. I'm preaching to you today. It's what I live for. I'm a rich man. I've got, every, I've got health. I've got a wife that loves me. Okay, I'm a rich man. I've got no problem with that. But what happens sometimes is a person who's got an extreme wealth will be driving down the road in his brand new motor car and come up behind a smoky, old, broken down vehicle that's hardly running. And you get so impatient and you hoot and tell him to get on the road. But the guy can't go any faster because he's only firing on two cylinders. You understand what I'm saying? Or he's parked on the side of the road and you say, look at him, taking up the traffic. He's going to cause a traffic ac a an accident. In the meantime, he's had a puncher because his tires are so smooth, he can't afford another tire. And he's overloaded because he's trying to make money. So you have no patience with somebody like that. You get a person who's suffering, who's in pain. Every time you meet them, oh, I'm sick and oh, I'm in pain. Pull yourself together, you say. Read the word of God. Believe what God says about you. Off you walk because you've never been sick. But I want to tell you something, my friend. Well, you've been sick really sick. When a person talks like that, you'll sit down and have a cup of tea with him. See? You see, when you've, when you've walked the Via Dolorosa, when you've walked that road, you're not so quick to judge others. When you started your business with an old broken down pickup, okay, then you realize that man on the side of the road, you understand because you were there. When you've been sick in your body, you're not so quick to moan at somebody that's complaining that they're not feeling well. My late mother was a sickly person all her life. But I want to tell you something now. When I was sick, I didn't want anybody else to nurse me but my mom. 
because she knew what it was like to suffer. You see, the Lord knows how you are feeling today. Why? Because He's been there. You see, you see, Paul understood suffering. He was thrashed, he was whipped, he was stoned, shipwrecked, he was uh, cast off, he was regarded as nothing, he was betrayed, all those things. Paul understands tribulation. And yet, you know what he says? He says in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, I rejoice in my tribulation, because tribulation worketh patience, patience character, and character hope. Our hope is in the Lord. I have yet to meet a man worth his salt who has not been down the Via Dolorosa. I haven't met a man yet. Folks, there's no shortcut to uh, learning, patience, understanding, compassion, love, being gentle. Let's be honest. I'm, not, I'm talking generally now. I'm not talking uh, the, the exception. I'm talking generally. Generally, you'll find young people have got a lot less patience than older people. Isn't that right? Why? Because the older people have walked further down the road, the road of the Via Dolorosa, the road of suffering. They've been to the school of hard knocks. They've been to the school of life, folks. I just wish that you could take a university course on suffering and learn from it then have to walk through it. But unfortunately, there is no course. You have to walk the road. You have to walk the road of suffering. And under, and under that circumstance, do you learn how to be patient with others? The more suffering you go through, the more patient you become. I remember a dear old lady that lived here, and you know her because I've often spoken about her. Her name was Peggy O'Neill. Auntie Peggy suffered from sugar diabetes blood pressure. She had cancer. She even had the one leg amputated eventually. I never heard an angry word come out of that old lady's mouth. Not once. She was the most beautiful person that I've ever known. She would sit there and I'd say, Auntie Peggy, how are you feeling? No, I'm a bit sore, Angus, but I'm fine. I praise God. How are you, Angus? See? <laughs> what can I pray for for you? Because I've got lots of time, Angus. I can only sit in this wheelchair. What can I pray for? That lady meant more to me than any other mighty man of God anywhere. Because I knew if she said she was going to pray for me, she did pray for me. You see, folks, there's nothing like a sympathetic ear, isn't there? Nothing like it. For somebody just to sit and listen to your problems. Now, the only people that can do that are people who have been there. A former alcoholic, a former drug addict will be able to minister to somebody who is battling with this whole substance abuse thing. Those of us who haven't been there, we don't understand. You see, we get impatient. Pull yourself together. Come on, man, you can do this. But they don't understand. Then you see a man who's walked that road. You say, hang on a minute, just give us time. And he'll sit there and he'll come from another angle. What? All of a sudden, you've got victory. A man who's going through financial difficulties. No good that man, I'm talking about a man who owns a big organization. There's no good trying to get a worker, and please, no disrespect for that, who gets a salary at the end of the month, never has to worry about where his money is coming from. He gets a salary at the end of the month. How can he counsel a man who's running a huge organization and who owns mil owes millions of rand every month and tell him how to live? He can't because he never carried that cross. We're talking about rejoicing in our tribulation, folks. And I want to submit to you today that He knows. And I want to say to you, as I get older, I'm learning to speak less and to listen more. Because I realize I don't really know that much. We need to carry our cross, folks. We can't get anybody else to carry it for us. At the end of the day, it's between you and God. That's all. I remember hearing a beautiful little illustration of a man who was tired of carrying his cross. So he took his cross and he threw it into a pile of crosses. And the Lord said, you can choose any cross that you want. So he walked along and he saw the most beautiful, huge cross made of solid, pure gold. Oh, he says to himself, I'll take that cross 
But you know something, folks? It was so heavy, he could hardly lift it. So he put it down. Then he looked around and he found another cross. It was beautifully adorned with roses woven right around it. A beautiful cross. I'll take that cross, he says. And he went and picked it up. And as he took hold of the cross, the thorns went into his hands from the roses. So he put that cross down. He looked around and then he found a cross that looked pretty much like his size, not too heavy, not too bright. And he picked up that cross and it fitted him perfectly. I'll take this cross. That was the very cross that he just laid down. God never allows you or me to be tempted above that which we are able to handle. Why? Because he knows. He's been there. He's walked this earth. He walked the Via Dolorosa the first time. You know, I love that little story. They tell me that in Nazareth, there's a carpenter shop. And there's a carpenter there by the name of Joseph. And uh, Joseph's son worked for him for 30 years. You know what I'm talking about, eh? And over the top of that little carpenter's uh, shop, there is a, um, a little uh, heading. It says, Yokes made just the right size for you. <laughs> okay? The Lord says, Come unto me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. There is no way that you will ever get out of walking the road of the Via Dolorosa, the road of suffering. If anybody preaches to you, come to Jesus and all your problems will be over, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. There's nowhere in this book that I can find that scripture and I've been looking for that scripture for many years. Every one of us will suffer. Every one of us has to walk that road. And every one of us will succeed if we cast our burdens onto Jesus who cares for us. You will not do it on your own. And you will not run away from tribulation. You say, well, I'm going to emigrate. I'm going to another country. Folks, the tribulation will be worse there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, no, but over there, there's no hijacking. And there's no HIV and AIDS. But there's lots of other things, folks. Very subtle. Things that you can't see that will really upset you. Okay, I want to tell you something. I went to a country, a first world country, I won't name it, many years ago as a young preacher. I was invited to this church. It wasn't a big church. We went to the back of the church. There was a little vestry there where the minister waits before the service starts. And in there, the elders were all standing in a circle. And the one man looked at me and he said, what are you doing here to me? He was quite a cheeky guy. He says, we don't have any violence here. We don't have any hunger here. We don't have any terminal HIV and AIDS diseases here. We don't have hijacking here. What do you want here? Why don't you go back to the country you come from and preach there? And I thought to myself, oh, sure. Maybe, Lord, I'm sorry, I've come to the wrong place. And then we started to pray until I heard one lady start to whimper. You know how a person whimpers? Like an animal that's been wounded, she started to whimper and then she started to cry and then she fell to her knees. And she said, Lord, please stop the suicide rate amongst our young people in this nation. And I, I'll never forget it, folks. We were all standing in a circle. Our eyes were closed. I looked up. I looked across to that man and his eyes were wide open like saucers. I never said a word. I just looked at him and I closed my eyes and I carried on praying. Friends, there are tribulation and suffering wherever you go because we are in a war. This is a war zone. The devil has one thing on his mind and that is to destroy us. And the Lord has one thing on his mind to give us eternal life. Now you have a choice today. And I'm going to pray for you at the end of this little message. And I have a choice. And the choice is simply this. Are you going to take your cross and are you going to walk the road? Or are you going to try everything in your power to duck and dive and run away from it? You will not get away from it. And before I pray for you, I want to tell you something else. 
There's a lot of teaching that goes all around that if you've got problems in your life, if you've got hardship in your life, it's because there is sin in your life. I don't agree with that, not at all. Why, Angus? I'll tell you why. Because if that was the case, then Jesus Christ had more sin in his life than anybody else. Because he suffered more than anybody that's ever walked on this earth. And he was without spot or blemish. Yes, he carried the sin of the world on his shoulders. And he was crucified because of your sin and my sin. But he had no sin within him. Every single one of the saints, the apostles, every one of them suffered severely for the sake of the cross, the sake of the gospel. And I want to tell you, I'm finding the closer I get to the Lord, the more the suffering intensifies. But you know something, folks? I would rather suffer here on earth and be welcomed home into heaven with open arms than to avoid suffering here by ducking and diving and get home to heaven for the Lord to say, get away from me, you wicked, into hell and damnation. We are in a fight. This is the fight of our lives. That is why every morning before I get out of bed, Jill and I lie in bed after I've told her I love her and uh, we tell Jesus how much we love him. We pray for our children and our grandchildren. And we put on the armor of God. That's why we wake up very early. We've got a lot of children and a lot of grandchildren. And we put on the helmet of salvation every single day. The breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of the gospel of peace. We take up the shield of faith to war off the fiery darts of the evil one. We take up the sword of the spirit, the word of God. This is the only weapon that we have. It's the only one that we need. And we go out with the joy of the Lord is our strength covered by the blood of the Lamb. Every single day before we put our feet on the floor. I want to encourage you to do that, folks. And then we pray without ceasing. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. We pray all the time. If we go from the farm into town, which is about 15 kilometers away, we pray before we leave the farm and go to town. And we pray when we come back. That's right. I pray every time I get into the airplane. I pray without ceasing. That's why it's so beautiful to be baptized in the Holy Spirit when the Lord gives you a new language. Because sometimes I might be in the United States of America and I feel prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray for my family and for my loved one, my wife. I don't know what to pray because I can't get hold of them. That's when I start to pray in the language which God's given me and God undertakes. And I can feel the peace come over me. Do not be afraid. God knows because He's been there. He spent many, many hours in prayer, the Lord. The Lord today, today, as I'm talking to you, He is in heaven. You know what He's doing? He is interceding on your behalf and my behalf. Isn't that wonderful? He's standing in the gap. That's right. That's what, he's going home. That's what He went home to do. He's preparing a place for you and I. So this, this program is not a negative program. It is a positive program. You know why? To be forewarned is to be forearmed. Isn't that how the saying goes? What kind of friend would I be of yours if I just said to you, oh, everything's wonderful and have a great day and, and uh, it's a lovely time and nothing will ever go wrong? Huh? Then you send in, I'm sending you like lambs to the slaughter. No, I'm saying go prepared. I am happy. You know that. I'm always laughing. I live a, a wonderful life. But I tell you something now, I am not unaccustomed to pain and to suffering. I'm not going to sit here, stand here today and give you my whole list of all my woes. Not at all. But I want to tell you something now. It is false preaching to stand there and say you got it all together. It's a lie. I have yet to meet, meet a, an honest man. I'm talking about an honest man who has not got some kind of problem, trial or tribulation. We need to realize we are walking a road. And the road leads to eternal life. And one positive thing about suffering and pain and tribulation, it takes all the rough edges off us. It, teach us to be, it teaches us to be more understanding, more forgiving. Okay? It teaches us to be able to understand why people do things the way they do. When I was a young believer, I'm telling you, I'm guilty and I've repented of it. For me, it was black and white, finished. No in between. It's either this way or that way. You know, it's turn or burn. You know, that type of stuff. 
I'm saying stuff because that's what it is. When you get older and you start tripping up and you start falling down and you have to get up again, and Jesus did too, didn't he? In fact, an African from Africa, Simon of Cyrene, he was told to pick up the cross when the Lord fell. I've walked that road, the Via Della Rosa, the one in Jerusalem. I've walked it. It's a steady uphill climb, and then you take a right angle. They say he fell right there, and that makes sense, me being a practical man. All the way to Calvary, and that's where he was crucified. Dead and buried for three days, and then, hallelujah, he rose from the dead, and he is seated in heavenly places. You have got a future waiting for you that you cannot even think of. So I want to encourage you to, to bear the burden, to walk the road, to take on that affliction face on. Don't run away from it. And God will see you right through to the end. He loves you, my dear friend. He loves you so much that he died for you. He loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to show you the way. And it's the way of the cross. It's the safest place to be. When you are under affliction and testing, it is very, very hard for the devil to tempt you. The only time that uh, King David was tempted was when he was lazy and he was left behind in the palace when all his men had gone to war. And then he saw that beautiful woman Bathsheba and he took her and committed adultery and then murder and then lies and everything else. Before that, he had no time. I'm telling you, the devil makes work for idle hands, folks. So if you're going through a time of testing, rejoice in it, man. It purifies you like salt. It really does. It cleanses you. You don't have time to think about evil things when you're too busy trying to put bread on the table for your family. Rejoice in your tribulation. Don't be envious of the man next door because you don't know what kind of cross he's carrying. Oh, Angus, I wish I could be like so-and-so. He's got so much money. Why does he look so round-shouldered when he drives that big motor car? Maybe he owes more money than you realize. Maybe he's got a wife that's unfaithful to him. Maybe he's got children that don't want to speak to him. I don't know. Just be content with your own cross and carry it with dignity and with power and with love. And let it use, let that cross be used as an example and as a help for you to make you more patient and into the man or woman that God wants you to be. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, none of us likes pain. None of us, especially me. I'm a bit of a coward when it comes to pain. None of us likes trials or tribulation. Lord, your grace is sufficient for each one of my friends listening to this program. So I thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Until the next time, may God bless you. Goodbye. This could be my best day. We trust that you were blessed by today's program. To find out more about Family Time with Angus Bucken, Grassroots, or upcoming events, please go to angusbucken.com.